welcome Dr. Jyoti Budi. I congratulate you. You are charisma by seeing the crowd and the delegates here. She is very down to earth person, helpful, very helpful, warm and affectionate. Thank you for the opportunity. And to 49 uh, fertility centers and seven centers across Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, ISAR Telangana Joint Secretary, ISAR Scientific Committee 2020, MS in Reproductive Medicine UK, first certified clinical embryologist, chapter contribution to several books, invited uh, guest uh, lecture at international and national conferences, presented many papers at national and international conferences, Times Best Fertility Clinic in South India 2021, Emerging, Times Excellency Award 2018, the best fertility clinic in 2018, HMTV Best Health Services Company Jury Award, BEA 2018, Indian Excellence Award 2017, National Healthcare Excellence Award 2016. I welcome you, Dr. Jyoti. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. At the onset, I would like to thank uh, all the delegates here I'm so overwhelmed today. Thank you so much. Admit the Sunday busy schedule, you're all here. So we value your time. And we have wonderful national speakers who have come all the way here. So I will uh, not take 30 minutes. I'll try to wind up in 20 minutes and give uh, you know time for our national speakers to move ahead. So they say it takes eight years to be a gynecologist. But to, the, to be the best version of our own self, it takes lifetime. In this space of making of our own self, there are lots of mentors, seniors, our um, many teachers here who I ha have a lot of respect. It may be our parents. So with a big salute to them with a bowing hand, I start my presentation. I'm talking about initiation of IUI with ovulation induction and folliculometry. So we'll start with the real-time case scenario, which happens day-to-day -day in our practice. Just to make a more, uh, you know, connected, I've chosen an arbitrary name, Sagar and Shilpa. These loving couples have, uh, she is 32 and Sagar is 36 years. They're married for 10 long years. And they're very anxious to have a baby. Since seven years, seven long years, everything is fine in this couple. Husband's sperm parameter is perfect. Her tubes are patent, but only problem what this Shilpa has is she has irregular cycles. Once in three to four months, she has cycle. So this is the most uh, you know, common scenario what we see in our obstet uh, in a gynec OPD. So let us, every time I feel patients are our best teachers. Whenever we see a patient, we learn a lot from them. So in, from her, I learned two important things. What are, they, what are those things what I learned was First thing was, why did it take seven long years for Shilpa to conceive? Only problem she has is irregular cycles. Then I was wondering what went wrong. I just went to pages and I started seeing her case notes, what happened for the seven long years. Again, end of the day, when we talk about folliculography or folliculometry, physiology plays a very pietal role. So after a beautiful talk uh, by Dr. Shravya, which was, you know, challenging cases, I'm taking into physiology, little subtle subject, but without understanding physiology, we can't be uh, good in ovulation induction. So it's so important to understand little basics about physiology. So once or whenever I think about physiology, I have fallen in love with the subject. Because it's so important what happens in the uh, ovary, day-to-day -day basis, it is something very, uh, I call it as a story of scientific romance. So what actually from the patient, what does patient want? From patient perspective, they want fast success rate with less side effects. This is what they want. So from Shilpa's case, what I learned two things was, whenever a lady comes with irregular cycle, say suppose she has come to me on day two, we start her uh, ovulation induction medication. We call her usually on seventh or eighth day. Then we do a scan. When we do a scan, what do we want to see? We all like to see a uh, uh, selected follicle. A follicle at least it is around 12 mm. But if at all, uh, if there is no follicle on 7th or 8th day, if all the follicles are less than 10 mm, what do we do? Okay, you're, there is no dominant follicle for you, you come again next cycle. Now, in case like Shilpa, 
if we don't give a withdrawal flow when will she come back to us she'll come after four months so we are losing four months four precious months in her so we as clinicians should be able to find the threshold dose for that woman and also there is something called as window period very very important these two small concepts i won't bore you i'll try to in five minutes finish this concept which is very important so from times immemorial from decades 20 decades everybody knows the study in 1996 to milson et al to today everybody knows to increase the clinical pregnancy rates with one follicle it is 8.5 pregnancy chances when it's two follicle the success rate doubles three they say triples but i don't suggest three we have to plan for two follicles but for whom i will be telling you in later slides of course after three it's, it doesn't increase at all so two is the ideal number so every house has a window even ovaries have their own window and the window doesn't open every time whenever we want so why do we we all know then we stimulate the ovary on day two three or four or five why do we do it when a lady comes to us on 14th day okay she has come she doesn't have time shall i stimulate her ovary have we ever done that we don't do it why is it it's because if you see physiology the window of the ovary is open only at that point of time what is that point of time it is the menstruation see there is a ovarian cycle there is a uterine cycle creation of god is so nice whatever is happening in the ovary it is not seen until we do scan but in a, you know physical way the Uh, endometrium sheds and we can see its menstruation so window period whatever happens in the ovary synchronizes with the uterus so that is the time a menstruation what we call so if you see this slide a lady with a normal reserve normal reserve window period is during menstruation a lady with pcos her she has a prolonged window period that's the reason even in pcos we can start the stimulation little later in women who has very less reserves one or two follicles window period is shortened what is this window period shortened you see on a day two if you do a follicular study on a lady with less reserve you already see one of the follicle dominant that means to say hpo axis is starting faster and already on day two it is a 14 mm follicle most of the time we see what is this that is the first time when we catch a lady that oh this lady is ovarian age is advancing if it is more than 10 mm ideally for a normal responder on day 2 the follicles should all be quite less than 10 mm but if a lady with two three follicles and one follicle is already dominant 12 to 14 mm then her window is shortened she comes usually if you see her history she comes with uh, shorter cycles from 30 it has become 24 25 15 that means luteal phase is fixed but her follicular phase is shortened and these ladies seven or eighth day itself they ovulate so it's a challenge for us and what happens in folliculometry if you see the follicles there on day 2 we would always like to see a follicle which is very quiet no activity at all resting phase of the follicle each follicle is less than 10 mm and then you don't like to see a dominant follicle on day 2 right if you see the endometrium also endometrium will not be triple line it will be shedding it will be less than 3 to 4 mm that is what we see in a uh, uterus then ideally on day 2 if you have to combine the ovarian cycle with the hormonal cycle if you have to do a estrogen and a progesterone uh, test uh, you know study estrogen is less than 50 picograms per deciliter progesterone is less than 1 nanogram per deciliter that is the lowest level of hormones in the body and all the follicles are very quiet and then what happens whenever the estrogen and progesterone is so low the endometrium shed because it's a withdrawal of hormone and then hpo axis you know starts pulsatility and then one of the follicle becomes dominant if you see on day 5 the follicle which was less than 10 mm 10 mm on day 2 becomes around 10 to 12 mm it that means selection has started day 5 or 6 selection starts happening then what happens on day 5 when a follicle get selected it starts producing estrogen it becomes a estrogen micro environment so estrogen which was 50 has become 75 to 100 now whenever estrogen becomes little high this a uh, dominant follicle wants to be a queen it does not want other follicles to follow so it sends a negative impulse to the brain hpo axis that is called as you know the negative 
the negative pathway of the estrogen. What it says to brain is, hey, I'm there here. I don't want other follicles to come. FSH, please come down. Immediately, FSH comes down. So the other follicles, if you see on day seven, which were supposed to become dominant follicle, you know, they, they go for atresia. Only this one becomes, uh, starts growing one to two mm. See example in other animals like cows, cats, dogs, elephants, this negative inhibition is not there at all. That's the reason they get six or seven follicles and that's the reason they, they have multiple pregnancy. And uh, thank to our uterus, it can bear only one or two kids. So this negative uh, uh, you know, pathway is so important to cause monofollicular growth of the follicle. Now on day seven, the follicle is already around, uh, uh, it's like around 12 to 14 mm. This too starts working. It starts increasing estrogen itself. Here if you see on day 10, follicle becomes around 14 to 15 mm. Now estrogen which was 50 on day 2 has become around 200 picograms per deciliter. All the book says, Spiroff, every book says 200 picograms of estrogen sustainably maintained for 50 hours, the LH surge happens. This is the, you know, one point which triggers the LH surge. So by then it is already two and a half days. So from 10th to 12th day, the follicle has become 18 mm now and it is ready to rupture. So once it ready, it, it ruptures, if you see in this video. So the follicles escapes from the, uh, the primary oocytes escape from the follicle and there is a graphene follicle. If you see, just I'll uh, fast track this. This is how I call to understand easy a marble in a balloon. The marble has to go outside now. So the follicles come and the uh, uh, you know balloon opens up and the primary oocyte which goes outside the uh, you know ovary and it is picked up by the fallopian tube and then this primary oocyte if you go in depth you know how fast it multiplies the graphene follicle which is covering the primary oocyte is washed away by the tubes that is what we do in IVF we take the primary oocyte wash it away then there is resumption of meiosis. The metaphase one oocyte becomes two, so immediately it's done and then there is, uh, if there is a pregnancy happens, that's what happens in the tubes. Now next is about threshold dose. So on day two, if you see all follicles, you don't see all follicles same size, four, four, four mm, five, five, five. They are different. One may be two, one may be three, or one may be five, six, seven. So each follicle has their own threshold and its own size. See, what is threshold? Threshold is very important. If you see the follicle here, they all have receptors. The larger the follicle has more receptors. What is this follicle? This follicle has more FSS receptors. It means it has the lowest threshold. So each follicle has a threshold dose. And then the threshold dose, once it is attained, how is threshold dose attained? In the body, because of the HPO axis, when H FSH pulsatile is there, the threshold dose is attained in most of the ladies. But in some ladies, when they don't ovulate, we find the threshold dose for them. We either give letrozole or clomiphene or gonadotropin depending on so many other factors. So finding the threshold dose for that ovary, for that lady is the most challenging step in ovulation induction. Our whole responsibility is to find the threshold dose for that follicle. So once the threshold dose is met, say suppose for some women it may be 5 mg letrozole, for some it may be 2.5 mg, for some it may be 7.5. So this is uh, very important to find the threshold dose. Once threshold dose is met, there is rescued by the FSH. And then the selection happens, the follicles start growing and rest of the follicles go for atresia. So now important concept of this threshold dose is in the window period, very challenging. If the threshold dose is met of one follicle, we get monofollicle. If the threshold dose is met for two follicles, we get two follicles. But it's so important, especially in PCOS, most of the follicles have same threshold dose. They all go together. You know, you give a dose, all the follicles come up. So it's very important to find the threshold dose. Now, individualizing the therapies, the, the need of the R. How to find the threshold dose? Each ovary is different, so it depends on the age of the woman, the AFC count, her AMH, and what was the previous response. Whenever we see a woman, please make sure you go back to her history and see previously what was her threshold dose. If you have seen a beautiful follicle, then you already know the threshold dose. It becomes very important for us. And then BMI also plays a major role. Now, what is an ideal protocol for IUI? How I do is, 
I first see woman whether she is ovulating or she is not ovulating. If she is not at all ovulating, she is having irregular cycles like Shilpa, my idea is to give one follicle, monofollicular. If a woman is already ovulating, that means every month she is releasing one egg already, what am I doing? I try to get, especially in unexplained infertility and endometriosis, I try to get two follicles for her to find the threshold dose. So selection, of course, does matter, whatever said and done. See, in IUI especially, best success rate is for a younger woman with an acceptable AFC count. Most of the time, tubes are patent, but when we do the scan, we see the tubo ovarian relation is altered. There's a lot of additions. So very important even, uh, uh, you know, scan. And of course, male factor pay, plays a very important role. And then less success in little older women with less AFCs, and uh, though tubes are patent, but still a lot of additions are there. I think Dr. Raji will be covering uh, all about IUI optimizing. I'll stick on to ovulation induction itself. So what about when should we do the first scan, very important. See, 10 years before, when I started my center, I was sending, I didn't have scan at the very beginning. I was sending all my patients for one of the, uh, you know, one of the radiologists to do a scan day two. They were refusing me. How can you do scan for day two? They are bleeding. Please don't send her now folliculography. You call only on 10th day. I was, no, 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 we are fertility expert. Day two is very important for us. So in 10 years, so much has changed about day two. I think if we take a raise of hand, everybody wants to do day two scan, right? You know, most of the time, I think we have a, sc a scan machine with us. We should do a day two scan, basic it is. Why is it so important? If you see on day two, all the follicles should be quiet. There should be no more than 10 mm, ideal time to start the uh, ovulation induction. Say, suppose in this woman, she has already a follicle which is 14 mm. She has come to you, you have seen her on day two. What do we do now? Ideally, I would like to postpone the cycle. I will tell her there is some follicle. I don't know whether it's follicle or cyst. But then she says, no, no, it's very important. My husband has come only for one month from out of country. Please induce, do something. Then what should I do is, I should find out whether it's a secretory follicle or not a secretory follicle. How do I know that? We know that on day two, estrogen is less than 50, progesterone is less than one. I do these two simple tests, call her next day. I tell her, okay, your both hormones are okay. This is a non-secretory cyst. It is not secreting, it's simply sitting there. So then I start my ovulation induction, call her on 10th day. Now on 10th day, I should, if I should on day to mark this follicle as non-secretory. On 10th day, she comes to me and if I see this follicle, already follicles are there, then we give uh, HCG trigger later, it won't rupture. This is because non-secretory follicle. On 8th day, I should see another follicle along with this which is growing up. That is very important point. And then, of course, when it comes to, there are a lot of armamentarium of ovulation induction. If you call who is the best, everybody is good in their own way. Of course, success rate of IUI, if you see compared to oral ovulogen, gonadotropins, uh, you, uh, you add, definitely it increases success, success, success rate. When it's come to ovulation induction, what I would like to announce today is, see, all of us gynecologists, you are the first place where an infertile lady comes to you. So 80% of the women, needs ovulation induction. So this still has, a, it's, it plays a major role like a queen. So this ovulation induction is very important. And then clomiphene citrate. Ideally we start with 50 mg and then on day 7 if there is no dominant follicle, uh, we, we can increase it to 100 mg. We should not waste time for her. Why is this? There is something called a stair step protocol. You call her on day 3, give 50 mg, call her on day 7, the threshold dose is not met. There is no dominant follicle. Now you can increase it to 100 mg itself. Why do you want to waste your time? Again, after that call seven days later, you see if there is no dominant follicle, you can make it 150 mg itself. So in this stair step protocol, what is the difference? It doesn't increase the pregnancy rate. It shortens the time to pregnancy. Three, four months, you are not wasting her precious months. That's what all the study says. About tamoxifen, I won't talk much because letrozole is already there. So efficacy is similar to clomiphene citrus. What about letrozole? There are lots of ways of using letrozole. The regular standard way. I have a short five protocols what I will just explain you. First is the standard protocol where 2.5 mg, they say, according to the uh, academics. But I usually don't use 2.5 mg. I start with 5 mg. So, 5 mg, what I, uh, this is another protocol, 2.5 mg if you give. She comes on seventh day, please don't tell her you, you don't have the threshold dose if it's not met, if there is no dominant follicle, don't tell her to come back again. Extend it, give for five more days and see. 
Then third protocol start with 5MG itself. And then fourth protocol is in some ladies where threshold dose is not met, you can increase the dose 2.5, second day 5, then 7.5 and then make it 100. And then say suppose in this woman all four protocols have failed, there is no dominant follicle at all. Go with the higher dose 7 point because in her 7.5 mg would be the threshold dose because 5 mg also she has not got dominant follicle. So start with 7.5. But not for every woman. First time you see, please don't start with 7.5. When it is failed, then that's the last chance what we have. You can go with 7.5 mg. So then now everything is done. Letrozole I have used everything. Uh, she's still not ovulated. What do we do next? What is else is available? Second line therapy is gonadotrophin. In gynecologist level, we are little hesitant to start off gonadotrophin because of risk of OHSS. So I was thinking most of the time we always in all seminars we compare clomiphene with letrozole, which is best. But I thought let us see if they work as friends together, what can happen? So some studies says even before going for a clomif uh, you know, gonadotrophin, there are three case scenarios where you combine them as friends. One case scenario is when a woman is not ovulating with letrozole, combined with glomiphene. Most of the studies says whoever is not ovulating, we know we have a word called as glomiphene resistance, but we still don't have a word called letrozole resistance. So you can combine, sometime ovulation happens and then, uh, yeah, we can go ahead. Then second scenario, when insulin resistance, still glomiphene has a role. Third is unexplained infertility, when you want little two follicles, in the window period you can give both the medication. Now gonadotrophins, because of the paucity of time, I'll just, uh, you know, go ahead fast. When you start gonadotropin, very important is in a window period, don't give very high dose. That is the reason where all the threshold dose of the, all the follicles are met, you will go with OHSS. If you want to see FSH or HMG, which is better, both, all, uh, you know, Cochrane says both are equal, whether recombinant or urinary, there's no clinical difference in pregnancy rates. Uh, and daily using, once you start FSH, should you continue it daily? It, that's, uh, you know, study says if you continue, clinical pregnancy rates are better. Antag I was using before, but it's not improving pregnancy rates. We have stopped even the study same, uh, says same. About this one slide, I will just uh, uh, brief you with. Very beautiful normogram. How to start the dose of letrozole? We all know how, how to say. Suppose a woman has come, she's 55 kgs, and she has 10 follicles. 75 is her First, first dose, same 55 kgs woman has 20 follicles, then 50 is her, uh, you know, starting dose. This is a normogram where you can choose which, uh, thanks to Jatin Shah sir, this is slide from your own presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, so step up protocol. Ideally, if you want to use gonadotrophin, start with lower dose, 50 units is ideal, but it's very expensive. If you have to use 50 units, you have to go with a recombinant pen. It becomes very expensive for our uh, country. This, most of the Western people where they have a recombinant pen, they use this protocol. In our country, we use standard step up protocol using 75 gonadotrophins and then call them on seventh day. If there is one dominant follicle, it means threshold dose is met. If there is no dominant follicle, we have to increase the dose to 150 and call her again to see whether the threshold dose is met. So everything depends upon the threshold dose of the follicle. And then now chronic low dose, they say for PCOS, you give a very low dose for longer time, 80% of the women will ovulate and even clinical pregnancy rates are good in these ladies. So then there is all step down, I won't go into depth because we don't use it now, it causes a lot of, uh, you know, OHSS and uh, multiple pregnancy risks. There are many protocols if you have to say, but in our Shilpa what happened was, she was PCOS lady. For her, what we did was, we started with, uh, uh, you know, letrozole and then continued HMG, she conceived. But if it is a uh, unexplained infertility, I always start with gonadotropin in the window period so that if I start uh, put gonadotropin on day three and day five, I may get two follicles. So this is, uh, it is, and then every time we concentrate on the follicles, what about endometrium? Most of the time follicle is 18 mm, endometrium is still 5 or 6 mm. So how do we do? If you delay one or two days, make the follicle 20 mm, endometrium may catch up, that is the first way. Second is, you should know whether 
a follicle is culprit or endometrium is culprit. Say, suppose follicle is 18 mm, endometrium is 6 mm. I do a test, again estrogen. Estrogen, if it is 250, that means the follicle is mature, it's releasing hormones. But endometrium is the culprit. Even with 250 estrogen, endometrium should have been 7 mm. It is not working well. Then I subject them for hysteroscopy. That means to say there is something issue in the endometrium. If the estrogen level is 100 or less, then I know follicle is the problem. It's not releasing estrogen. So I give more time for um, endometrium. Now, this is one typical example. This was uh, some three years back, I got this prescription. They have started letrozole. They have started with, uh, you know, 5MG, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th day. Without doing follicular study, they have started progynova, estrogen also. So what wrong it is here? All threshold dose is not met. You are already suppressing. See, once in uh, letrozole you are giving and causing anti-estrogenic effect, FSH uh, start pulsatiling. By the time it is getting selected follicle, you are dumping estrogen. So follicle get confused. So very, very important, uh, wrong usage of estrogen can even hamper the normal folliculogenesis. So in hypo-hypo, we have to use HMG preferably. So conclusion slide is gonadotrophins, definitely gives increased pregnancy rates in IUI. So when to use gonadotrophin, only thing we should remember is window period, we should not overshoot the dose and that is the only time when if you, the follicles get, all the follicles get selected. So thank you everybody. So they say spirit of physician is to be a permanent student of science the, because the absolute uh, truth of today is a related truth of tomorrow. Thank you so much. IUI? Ovulation induction and folliculometry, you, it was very crystal clear, given us very practical points and your slides are also excellent. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Any doubts? Hi ma'am, I have three doubts. One is uh, whether the cyst on day two is functional, non-functional. Can we see the endometrial thickness and decide it or it is needed to do only estrogen? On day two? Day two. Okay, very valid doubt. Uh, day two usually endometrium should shed, it should become less than 3 mm, it's a yeah. very valid point. But in say, suppose PCOS, what happens? Three months she doesn't menstruate at all. So endometrium is so thick, these people will have cystoglandular hyperplasia, along with steen levilthal syndrome, we used to call it before. Big ovary with irregular cycle, thick endometrium. So in most of these PCOS, what happens on day two also, endometrium is seven or eight mm, it doesn't shed properly. So as a marker, According to the any studies, endometrium can't be taken totally to find out whether it is totally in the, um, uh, you know, it is in the resting phase. Okay. So, combined together, as a clinician, the more scan we do, we know, okay, the follicles are all quite, endometrium is quite, yeah. so I don't want to do hormone test. Yeah. Ideally, I don't believe in doing too many tests. But yeah. in certain situation, when we need to know what the diagnosis is, these come to play. And one more doubt. These uh, gonadotropin injections, do you give uh, daily or alternate days in any protocol? I will be very, very honest days? here. I don't give daily because cost also plays a major role. Um, if you weigh and balance, giving daily, uh, I started for few patients long time back, but the expenditure, what they have, and they don't become pregnant, it's like IVF money, and they don't become pregnant. We know uh, yeah. for ovulation induction, so I ideally... Uh, yes, don't give if you daily. give one or two injections also, they are ovulating. Uh, what I do is ideally I start with uh, 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 oral ovulogens because it sen sensitizes the yeah. gonadotrophins. The dose becomes, the requirement dose becomes very less. So I combine most of the time with letrozole and then once the follicle is dominant, then I add uh, the gonadotrophins. One more doubt, ma'am. Does uh, progyno has no role, ma'am? No, not exactly no role. I'll come to it. <laughs> progyno means estrogen basically. Pro uh, so estrogen has a role. It's like a weapon you should be very strong in your academics. If you see a dominant follicle, already selected follicle, only endometrium is a problem. Again, when it go to uh, academics, it becomes very debatable. Most of the study doesn't support estrogen. But if you know this follicle is dominant, it's doing every very well, ideally the endometrium should catch up. Estrogen in the follicle would have been 250, endometrium should have come. There is some issue. So uh, ideally, it's better to avoid estrogen. But um, you know, so many times uh, it happens that, okay, one or two days we will give. But again, it's always a debatable topic. 